Good evening. Welcome to the membership meeting of the Cooperative and Condominium Advisory Council. I am Jeff Hanley, Associate Director of the CCAC and our parent organization, the Building and Realty Institute. On behalf of our chair, Diana Verrill, and our vice chairs, Jane Curtis and Angelo Ponzi, welcome. A couple of program notes before we begin our presentation. If you have not filled out our registration green card, please do so. As you are leaving this evening, we would appreciate that. Also, if you have not gotten your parking validation sticker, please see me at the end of the program at the front desk. We would be happy to validate your parking stub. And this way you would not have a parking fee as you were leaving the garage of the Crown Plaza. A couple of quick program notes. The next general membership meeting of the Building and Realty Institute is scheduled for Thursday, June 12th, 630 here at the Crown Plaza. The topic is development issues in the New York City watershed. We have the Assistant Attorney General of New York State, Philip Bean, is our key speaker. That is Thursday, June 12th, 630 here at the Crown Plaza. The evening before, Wednesday, June 11th, we are having a meeting for the members of our collective bargaining group on issues that the BRI will be focusing upon in its upcoming labor contract negotiations with Local 32 BJ. That meeting is only open to buildings and complexes that are members of our collective bargaining group. Again, that is Wednesday, June 11th, 6.30, here at the Crown Plaza. You'll be receiving reminder notices on those two events in the days ahead. We hope to see you at both programs. At this point, I will turn over the podium and the mic to Jason Skishano of Levitt First Associates and he will handle the program from this point on in terms of the program content and the speakers. You all know Jason, everyone please welcome Jason Skishano of Lever First Associates, our insurance manager for both the CCAC and the BRI. Thank you. Hi, good evening. I'm Jason Skishano, I'm co-president of Levitt First. The other co-president of Levitt First, Ken First, is right over here. If you came to support us this evening, thank you, Ken. And I'm here this evening with Peter Anderson, who's uh, Director of Risk Reduction Services. Risk Reduction Services is another company uh, formed by Levitt First uh, for reasons that you'll hopefully understand much better at the end of our, our, our presentation. Uh, this evening, we wanted to explain to you why the insurance certificate is not enough and hopefully uh, have uh, instill upon you a better idea of what risk transfer for contractors working at condominium and cooperative apartment buildings is all about. Obviously, this relates to property management and to owners of property, specifically condominiums and cooperatives. I know many of you read the Cooperator magazine, and it often has many uh, excellent articles relating to insurance issues. There was an article recently uh, entitled Escalating Insurance and Your Contract. And what it talked about, as you've heard me say from time to time when I presented, you know, uh, New York is unique in the entire United States. It's the only state in the union where if an injured worker seeks remedy, he can claim something other than just workers' compensation insurance. Every other state in the union, just workers' comp for an injured worker. In New York, there's more. In New York, we have Labor Law 240 and 241 which basically allows an employee to make a liability claim against the property owner, the property owner, the condominium or the cooperative for an injury that occurred on the property. 
So there are several sections to this law. 240 involves gravity-related injuries uh, caused by falls. 241 involves trip hazards and flooring and elevators. And 241A involves openings of stairwells. But in essence, they all accomplish the same thing, which is to give an injured worker an avenue to file a lawsuit against the property owner and have a basis for a liability claim. Now, we're not just talking about little teeny tiny liability claims here that you can make go away, you know, by a $5,000 check for results. In New York, these claims, and keep in mind this was a year ago, things have only gotten worse since then. In New York, these claims typically average, according to the article, about $850,000 or more. Now, what this means for insurance carriers is if you're an insurance company and you've got 50 states to do business in to insure contractors or buildings, would you look to New York you know, to make A? Probably not. They're going to go elsewhere. As a result, there are very few contractors in New York servicing the consumer. The consumer. Who's the consumer? Contractors? Yeah. Does this law only affect contractors? No. No. It affects the property owner. Property owners are consumers of insurance as well, and this law in every way affects property owners in addition to contractors because the law allows the injured worker to sue the property owner. And so, Everybody is aware of this fact in general terms, and everybody understands that it's important to try to transfer risk away from the property owner, away from the condominium or the cooperative or the apartment, and onto who? Where do you want to transfer the risk? If you're, if you're a cooperative or a condominium? Where? Back onto the contractor. Excellent. You get a free hand sanitizer. Make sure to hold it in the right direction. It is not mouse, it is not fresh press. Correct. So why is it important? Why do we want to transfer risk away from the property owner and onto the contract? Cost. Cost of what? Cost of insurance. Cost of insurance. Okay, so if the property owner's insurance gets hit with a claim for an injured worker who is injured from a fall from heights or gravity related or trip and fall hazard from Labor Law 240-241, and if the property owner's insurance has to pay that claim, what happens? Insurance goes up. For what? For how much? How long? Forever? Not quite forever, probably not. Insurance has ever gone down. Well, actually, you know what? Insurance went down for about eight years before the last few years, so that's not exactly true. But your insurance is going to go up most likely in, in a vacuum, all other things being equal. If you have a claim of this nature for $850,000 against your condo or your, or your co-op that's not picked up by the contractor's insurance, your condo or co-op insurance will, will likely go up, all other things being equal, for certainly several years to come. Because condo and co-op insurance carriers look at something called what? Experience. Experience. What, what kind of? Loss experience, right? And they, they typically look back how many years? Five years. Five years. See, we have a very educated group here. Okay. So risk transfer is critical because you don't want an $850,000 claim on your condo or co-op loss experience for five years affecting your insurance premiums. So how do you get it? How do you get law, how do you get risk transfer? We subrogate the other line. Subrogate. What do you need in order to subrogate? It has to have insurance that names you co-insured. Has to have what? Insurance that names you co-insured. Okay. So you have to somehow rely on the contractor's insurance. What are the what do you need to make that happen? You need proof that it's fulfilled. What else? What do you need? You need a good advisor. Someone said additional insured back there? 
What do you need to show your additional insurance? Certificate of insurance? Certificate of insurance from who? From the contractor showing the property owner as additional insurance. Additional insurance. Okay. So here's the certificate of insurance. Does everybody recognize this? Everybody recognize this document? You looked at it carefully hundreds of times, right? You ever read this portion? No. It's a portion in big black letters at the very top. Bold print. I'll read it for you. <laughs> it says the certificate is issued as a matter of information only and confers no rights upon the certificate holder. That's just comforting. This certificate does not affirmatively or negatively amend, extend, or alter coverage afforded by the policies below. The certificate holder does not constitute a contract between the issuing insurer's authorized representative or producer and the certificate holder. Then in a little bit smaller bold black print at the top of the document, it says, important. <laughs> if the certificate holder is an additional insured, the policies must be endorsed. And then it goes on to say a couple more things. And it says, a statement on this certificate does not confer rights to the certificate holder in lieu of such endorsements. So everyone, or a lot of people here has told me, you got to get the certificate. What does the certificate give you? Nothing. Not much. It gives you information. If you're the property owner, it doesn't give you a lot of rights, that's for sure. Okay? Now, as I stand here, I should say, and I, you know, I, I haven't fought these battles in court. There, there have been court cases that have been decided where the certificate alone has given some level of coverage. I'm not saying that if you have the certificate and only the certificate, it's it's worth, literally worthless. But it's close. <laughs> I wouldn't want to rely on the certificate alone because truly, the certificate alone is not enough. What do we do? All right, so, certainly the first thing that you need to have, and whenever you file an insurance claim, the very first thing that your insurance broker's claim department get, gets asked by the carrier that's, asking, that's being asked to provide coverage is a contract. If you are doing business with contractors on a handshake or a verbal contract or you've been using them for years and you just notice to show up in the spring and start cleaning the shrubbery and beds and whatnot, and clouds of snow and you know whenever it snows, you should have a written contract in this day and age. You should also have certificates of insurance because they do evidence and they're issued by the insurance broker, and if the insurance broker is reputable, then hopefully he's not issuing an insurance certificate that is false or um, is, is, it, is uh, exhibiting information that's not true. So at least with the certificate, you know that the contractor has insurance, and that the insurance, assuming the premiums have been paid, are, is in force for the, terms, uh, for the uh, term listed on, on the certificate. But the other key document, and it may be embedded in the contract, is the indemnification and insurance requirements agreement. So the three things, a contract, an insurance certificate, and an indemnification and insurance requirement agreement. So with those documents, how do you administer risk transfer? Because when you think about it, if you're a condominium or a cooperative, you've got a lot of contractors. And every single one of them has several insurance policies. And every single one of those insurance policies has a different expiration date, most likely. Frequently, the workers' compensation insurance expires at a different time than the general liability insurance. And, if you're a managing agent or you have a managing agent that, that manages the property and they're managing 50, 30, 60 properties, 
that's a lot of documentation to collect. When you think about an indemnification, additional sure requirement, and a certificate for every single location, for every single contract. So risk transfer document, uh, uh, document administration is collecting the certificate, the indemnification for all the contractors and all the properties, verifying, by the way, most of your condominium and cooperatives have a contract with the managing agent, right? Right, everybody has a contract with their managing agent. And probably in that managing agent contract, you've agreed to do what for your managing agent? Pay him. What? Pay him. <laughs> Anything else maybe related to risk and insurance? Well, I can Who said that? Hold Indemnify. You've probably agreed to indemnify your manager. Well, if I'm an injured worker and I hurt myself in a labor law 240-241 claim in New York, I'm going to sue everybody that I possibly can. So I'm not only going to sue the condo or the co-op, I'm also going to sue the managing agent. So, yes. It certainly doesn't hurt. And, and on the kind of co-op policy, the board is automatically covered. Okay, so, so you want to make sure that the managing agent, the building manager, and the property are named in all of these documents. And then you need to collect them and store them. And then also, ideally, you need to be able to present the document status in an easy to access and useful format, right? Someone's got to have all this stuff somewhere and be able to access it. You know, maybe you're not going to pay a contractor before you verify he's got all this information properly submitted to you and in good order. So, you know, to have a file full of wrinkled certificates and indemnifications in this file and this thing got this file over here is probably not very functional. So, as we've discussed, you need a certificate of insurance and you need the indemnification and additional insured requirements, but you need to be able to have access to them to be able to know what they say and how long they're valid for, etc. You need to make them useful. And so the question is, now that I've educated you, for those of you that didn't understand what risk transfer was and how to accomplish it, the question is, how do you accomplish it? I'll have Peter go into this at this point. Thanks, Peter. Good evening, everyone. So, we talked about the risks you're facing, the stresses involved in collecting this information. Um, so the question becomes, what are you doing now? And how successful are you in what you are doing? So are you currently collecting certificates of insurance? We talked about they're not the be all and end all, but they are important. They verify insurance. They verify the coverage for a policy term. And are you collecting the indemnification agreements? from all of your clients, from anybody that's coming onto your property and doing work. Not only are you collecting it, are you organizing it? Are you collecting it so that you can pull it back up when the need arises? It's not just having the information, it's having the information when you need it, that you start to really get the benefit of having a good program in place. Yeah. Workers' comp audits, they happen very regularly. If you can't get the verification that these companies have workers' comp, you're going to be the ones paying for it. It's going to come off of your workers' comp policy. Are you getting updates? If a job is happening over the course of a time frame of three or four months and that policy renews in the middle of that time frame, are you getting the renewal certificate? Is the wording the same? Is it giving you additional insurance status for your property or the building manager? Okay? Remember, if you have workers' comp, you have general liability, you have the auto, you know, it's a very auto-intensive uh, job, those might have different dates. So you want to make sure you're collecting not only the original information, but remembering to get that information as the renewals take place. 
So what do you need to know? You need to know, first of all, the, con the contact information for a lot of your contractors. Very simple, very straightforward, but you need to be able to access that information at any given moment. You need to know where, if, for the building managers, for the uh, managers of your properties, where are they working if they're working at multiple properties to make sure that you're getting the verbiage that you need on the certificates, that you're getting the additional insurance stats for all the properties, making sure that your property is protected for any, any contractor that's coming on. Now, we've discussed this quite a bit about what you should collect. The indemnification, we've spoken a lot about it, the indemnification insurance requirement agreement, it works as an agreement. The one thing that a certificate truly lacks is it's not a contract. It is a one-directional document. It is given to you by the carrier stating coverage, but you're not signing it. The point that you run into a lot of times, and we talked about additional insured status, is you have blanket additional insured coverage on the policies, and that requires a contract. This can work as a contract, as well as the original contract for the work being done. But if you have a, a co-signed document, a indemnification insurance requirement agreement, it protects you and it gets you that additional insured status that you're looking for. Certificate of insurance. Generally, you like to have one million, two million on your basic certificate of insurance. That is the standard for most of your commercial contractors. You'd like a million dollars auto, especially for those contractors that are auto intensive, okay? If their vehicles are, heavy vehicles are coming on your property, you wanna make sure that if they hit five of your vehicles, and one of those vehicles, few vehicles happen to be BMWs and Mercedes, they have the coverage to protect you. Or if they hit, God forbid, one of your, you know, tenants. Umbrella, clearly, a great idea to have an umbrella for all of your contractors. It's not going to happen for your smaller contractors, but it will happen for any of your large jobs. You want to make sure for any capital improvement, for any of those situations where large work is being done, roofing work is being done, anything that can have large potential claims, you want to make sure that you have an umbrella policy in place for that. And workers' compensation. Um, we're going to talk about this a little bit in a minute. Workers' compensation is required for any company that has employees. But you will notice there are going to be a lot of sole proprietors that come onto your property, individuals, that do work, and they do not have workers' compensation. We're running into very large increases in workers' compensation premiums, and for a sole proprietor, it is cost prohibitive to have a workers' comp policy. There are risks associated with that. But as long as you understand the risks, it gives you some idea whether or not you want to let them work on your property or not. The primary concept with sole proprietors is that they don't have the workers' comp themselves, so it will fall onto your policy at audit. So if the workers' comp for your building, uh, if they do a large amount of work, and a lot of that is based on their uh, effort, not supplies, that will come onto an audit for you. So, it's an arduous task. This is a lot of information for your properties. You've got 10 to 20 contractors regularly coming to your property. How do you keep on top of this? You know, it's too much work. Is it necessary? I'll just give you a few examples as to situations that have actually arisen that we've dealt with directly or indirectly, just to give you some ideas on some of the things that you may run into. Recently, we had an individual um, not send us a renewal certificate for their general liability policy. And they were doing quite a bit of work, including roofing work, for one of the property managers in the region. We went, we talked to them back and forth. It turned out that their general liability policy was too expensive. They just didn't renew their policy. It was that simple, but it happened in the middle of the season, and the building manager if they hadn't asked, wouldn't have known that they just didn't do it. And they were not going to renew that policy regardless of getting the job. Proactively, you can address such a situation and make sure those people are not working on your property. It is far too much risk. Why did the board like him, anybody? He was cheap. He was cheap, why was he cheap? <laughs> he wasn't paying for insurance. That happens <laughs> during the course of job that he's doing for you. Do you have recourse? Well, if he cancels in the middle of the term, it's very rare for you to have much. 
you know, you're not going to find out about it. Um, at the bottom of the certificate, it says um, you'll be notified by in, for cancellation as per the policy. And the policies do not notify for certificates holders for the most part. So there are, just, you know, there are, there is no perfect solution for any of these things. That's why you have your own insurance. <laughs> Our goal is to make sure that you do everything you can so that when the renewal comes up, if there is a claim, you can say, we set these processes up. There's no foolproof method, but you want to make sure that at renewal, you are getting that information so that if something, you know, God forbid one of your contractors <coughs> decides not to renew, you're catching that down. And the renewal certificates are certainly always a 12 month period. I'm sorry? The renewal of the certificates are Correct. certainly 12 months. Yes, auto, personal auto that some of the smaller contractors use will be a six month period, but everything else is going to be a 12 month period. So if you have a sole be a small six months. You won't see six months except for like a Geico policy for an individual that has an F150 <laughs> that they use as a handy okay. That's the only time you'll see a six month in the US. Contracts. We mentioned the importance of contracts. I'm sorry, yes. I have a question to ask my students. Maybe I missed something. Would it not say in your original proposal, in your original contract, with your roof work? Well, he was a handyman that did roofing work, but yes. No, excuse me. If you're a co op, you don't hire the handyman to do the roofing, you hire the company. You are correct. That carries insurance. But if he goes up to the clean gutters and such, so is that, I, I didn't say his daily work. His daily work, the building is covered. Okay. Yes, he cleans the roof, empties the gutters. Correct. I'm talking about doing roof. Mm -hmm. You hire a contractor. You would hire a roofer, absolutely, for that. This was a simple scenario. And you're saying that in the meantime, his insurance lacked because he didn't pay the premium. Correct. Does that not make his contract gone? Who's going to say, who's going to catch that though? Excuse me. Who's going to catch that though? The, bu the building's lawyer, the building's insurance. That's company. after a claim, excuse certainly. Me. Or you're my insurance company. My insurance company wouldn't be there the next day if he didn't catch that. If he didn't see when the roof is uh, insurance was over, when the period his period of insurance, mm -hmm. and if it was in the middle of the contract, they'd have to show him the week before that they paid. How do you let them come into a building that was in do a roof and not have insurance? No, that if they're, if, if it's ongoing work, work, certainly if it's a new job, but if it's ongoing work, what happens is you collect the information at the beginning of work. Mm -hmm. and, and if that information lapses, and if their insurance policy expires, expires is period, different from lapsing, okay? I Expiring, yes. Lapse, if it expires sure. during that period, mm -hmm. it's somebody's responsibility yes, it is. to make sure that 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 is our point. That is our point exactly. It is somebody's responsibility. And the point that we're trying to make is, is that responsibility being taken seriously and being taken care of? Second option here, second situation, a Sandy claim. We all ran into Sandy. We all had problems with so many properties. Um, in this particular case, there was a tree damage that was causing some sort of problem on the property. Had to get repaired quickly. Okay. The contract was signed literally on a napkin. There was a claim. Now, the problem in this particular case was the additional insured status. It didn't matter that the certificate said that there was an additional insured or not. There was no contract for that work. The contract was lost, the napkin was lost, amongst, amongst everything else that lost, got lost with Sandy. So the claim that arose, there was no additional insured status for this particular situation. Again, you want to keep track of this information. That indemnification agreement would have covered you because it's a co-signed document. It becomes a contract for future work as well. So providers, we talked about them a little bit. Um, knowing that someone considers themselves a sole proprietor is essential to you. Okay, Just because someone comes onto your property with five employees doesn't mean they're employees. You need to know that you hired a sole proprietor, that they don't have workers comp. And the second they walk onto your property with more than one person, more than just themselves, you need to make sure that work doesn't happen. Okay, Because that happens all the time. In this particular case, true case, day laborers came on digging ditches, during after a storm, the 
stitch collapsed, one died, one gravely injured. Again, no workers' comp associated with this contractor at all because he was a sole proprietor. You know, they get offered a good job, they get offered the financial means to do it, they say, yes, I can do it, they go down and they bring people with them. Again, knowing the, knowing the information, knowing who is a sole proprietor, so much more important. And this is what we were talking about, no workers' compensation for a roofer. The workers' compensation policy had lapsed and someone had died and a huge claim. At this point, it was a huge claim. This is years ago. This $400,000 claim would be dramatically higher these days. Um, but that went directly against the building and doubled the premiums for at least two years at the point that this was done, at least two years. Excuse me. Yes. In this case, was, was the claim valid because the roofer claimed that there was something unsafe that caused him to fall, or was one that he had? Injuries are injuries. You know, there's going to, there, there was no workers comp to protect him, so if, you know, any of us, if we're injured and we don't have anything, you're going to do what you can to recoup your medical expenses. And, and in New York, this whole labor law that he's referring to is absolute liability on the building. So even if the roofer was drunk, even if the roofer was told, don't go up on the roof, there's, it's, you know, that, it's raining, the, and the ladder, don't use that ladder, it's broken. The roofer falls, it's the building's fault, 100%. But that's why the claims are settling all in seven figures, because there's no defense. There's no defense for the building owner whatsoever. Did everyone hear Ken back there? So there is no defense regarding a fall from heights due to the labor laws. Um, if you are drunk, if you are, you know, on a slippery roof, if you've been told not to be where you are and you injure yourself, there is still 100% liability to the building. <coughs> so, risk transfer, making it happen. We've talked about all the scare tactics. We've gotten you nervous about it. So what do you do? Right? The key is to make sure that you are proactive in this. What are the elements of a, of a successful program? You're collecting the documents up front, absolutely essential. You have an indemnification agreement that you have agreed on, your lawyer has agreed on, that is an acceptably worded indemnification agreement. You're collecting it from everybody. You are organizing these documents so you can access them. Again, having the documents are very little importance if you can't get them when you need them, when the audit comes, when the claim comes. It's the ability to gather that information at the time of need. And monitoring and updating. You have contractors coming in this month and then they come in in two months if their policy lapses in the middle or their expiration date. You have to make sure to get their renewal policy. If they're coming throughout the year, you might have two or three expiration dates that you have to make sure to collect that information. Usually it's no more than three. That's the worst case scenario. It doesn't happen. So, how do you do it? Internally, within the organization, there are some options. Paper tracking is the standard, and it's a little bit terrifying to those of us that do this for a living, <laughs> because you have a file drawer, and you put everything into the file drawer, and you have it labeled by contractor, or by date, or by building, or by whatever the case is. But the difficulty here is getting the renewals of those certificates. You don't know when those certificates are renewing because you put them in as you've got them. We run into this all the time. It's a scary proposition. Do not recommend the paper option. <coughs> Database tracking, a little bit better. At least you're keeping track of your contractors using date, you know, basis for all of it. At least you're getting general liability and workers' comp. You're making sure to ask them for that information, collecting that information, storing it. At least if you're using it on the computer, possibly scanning the information so you can access it later, you're giving yourself the, really a leg up on those people that have the document paper based trail. Property management software. Some of the programs out there that manage the particular properties will have don't pay unless, you know, this is checked unless it's, you can put a date in there for some of them. Um, so you will pay up until a date, but that date could be the general liability expiration date. So you can make sure that no checks are going out of your office after a particular date unless you get the renewal and then you move that date forward. So they have simple tools within those programs that may assist you. 
there are third party options out there. Okay, you're gonna have to go onto the web and look. There are several programs that do this. Some will sell it directly to the property manager or to the building. It makes the use a little bit easier. It gives you places to put the information that you need to call up later. You still have to store, you still have to access, but at least this gives you some of the tools. And then there are external programs. And an external program are going to be full service providers that take that tool away from you, take the process away from you. Um, development of tools, there are several of us out there, risk reduction being one of them, uh, where we actually do the collection for you and let you know when a contractor is in or out of compliance. And that allows you to directly work only with those contractors that are in compliance. So the conundrum, Jason? Just to finish up, before I uh, conclude, I want to make sure that everybody understands, based on the certificate that I showed you earlier, that certificate alone is not enough. What else do you need? The contract. The contract, and the contract has to have in it an indemnification. An indemnification, a hold harmless, basically says the contractor is going to protect you if a claim arrives from an injury from his worker. And it also says additional insured status, right? I agree to name the property owner as an additional insured. It's that trigger for coverage in the contract that gives you the additional insured status. That's why you need both, okay? But the conundrum is this. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of staffing, and all of those things relate to money, right? Now, those of you that are associated with a condo or a co-op in here, do any of you do this on your own, meaning the condo's board or committee members? Or, and show of hands, does anybody do this on their own? You say on your own. If, if, you're, if, you're, if you are a uh, unit owner or shareholder in a condo or a co-op, or if you're on a board of a condo or a co-op, do you actually self-manage or do this stuff on your own? Raise your hand. Okay, a couple, a couple do. And then if you rely on your managing agent or property manager to do this, raise your hand. Okay, several more. And that's pretty typical. There's a lot of condos and co-ops that either because they're smaller or because they're saving money, they're self-managed and they have to do this on their own. And then there's others that are managed by managing agents that expect their managing agent to do this. No matter who's doing it, it takes time, it takes people, and it takes money. And the question is, after what we showed you, can you afford not to do this well? No. You can afford not to do this well as long as there's not a claim. Right. <laughs> and for, frankly, most of you, most condos, most co-ops, frankly, you won't have a claim. I don't know what the percentage is, maybe in 100 years or 50 years, maybe 10% of you will have claims, 90% won't, maybe it's 80, 20, I don't know. But mark my words, you don't want to be the other 10% or 20% that has a claim, and you don't want to be a shareholder or a unit owner in a condo who gets the increase in your maintenance costs or your common charges for the next five years to pay the premiums, which as Peter said, potentially, and I've seen it, not only double, I saw one triple this year. You don't want to be in that condo or co-op. So if, if you're not sure how your condo or co-op is addressing this right now, find out. Protect your property by taking control of your risk transfer documents. And if you're not sure, but you're interested in taking the first step by just knowing what these documents look like because you walked in here thinking that it was the certificate alone, it's all, all that you needed. And we didn't even get into, by the way, the details that need to be on the certificate and how it needs to be marked off because that's just boring. But if you want, come up to Peter or myself, we'll be around for a couple more minutes. If you give us either a card or your contact information, we will email you a sample indemnification hold harmless agreement and a sam sample certificate of insurance 
like the ones we flashed up on the screen, and you've got that in the first step. So what if you have a class or we're talking about business management, we had Peter do it or something? Could you who's your, who's your, the question was how much does, how much does it cost to risk reduction services? Mm -hmm. Who is your managing agent? Okay, so we, risk reduction services actually contracts through managing agents. A number of managing agents in Westchester use this service, and obviously some don't, but they've got other ways to do it. And what I would ask you, because of the way we're set up, either as, have your, have, you know, as a board member contact Peter, his business card is there, he can go over pricing with you, it varies, but really the service is through the managing agent. Services to the, the, what we're trying to show here tonight is just the importance of collecting the documentation and the documentation that you actually need to collect in the format that it should be in. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes. We're a managing agent for condominiums. We do have full harmless agreements with owners when they hire a contractor. And we, of course, get the the, the insurance certificate and all that. But we don't collect their contracts. As the risk uh, transfer company, would you collect the contracts that the owners within the condominium sign? Right. So the, the, the question is, there's, there's two types of contractors that come onto a property, right? There's the contractors servicing the actual co-op or the actual association. And then there's the contractors that come in basically on a private basis to do work like, you know, unplugging a toilet if that's their responsibility, or to do renovations inside of a union. That type of thing, right? The first question I have is, do you collect, do you collect the, uh, both documents, the certificate and the indemnification for all the service contractors that are servicing the associations? Yes. Yes, okay. So that's, that's, you know, in terms of the association's insurance, that's arguably the bigger exposure. Um, risk reduction does not collect for unit owners or shareholders doing work inside the individual units, but we can help you develop a system in order to do that, and we've been asked to do that on a number of occasions. So the, an owner signing, when they, they're gonna have a contractor come onto the property, to, if it's, say they're doing a renovation, they actually sign a renovation document that says that they will hold the condominium and then yeah. The company harmless. But I'm not sure if I'll give you, holding a right, here's, is going that's to a great the, point. So contract, here's some right? here's some guidance on that. The, your your point is that when, when they when the managing agent is tracking and the contractor is going into a unit to do work inside the unit, you have the unit owner hold the association harmless. Right. And you're you're exactly correct. I would not want to rely on the unit owner and the unit owner's net worth and the unit owners maybe $300,000 worth of liability insurance, if they have insurance, I would not want to rely on that. And frankly, they can't even name you as an additional insured anyway on a homeowner policy, typically. So ideally, you should change your process for your, for your you know, renovation um, package and sign off whereby you require the contractor going into that unit to name the unit owner as an additional insured, to name the association as an additional insured, and to name the managing agent as an additional insured. And, That's certainly for larger and, and also to get the indemnification and additional insured agreement. And certainly for larger renovations in an apartment, doing the whole process, getting that indemnification agreement as if they were working for the association, is absolutely a good idea. You know, if they're just doing, you know, a small kitchen rent, that's one thing. But if you're talking about doing a large renovation, you need to treat them as if they are working on your property, because um, it really can affect a lot. Right. But I mean, many of you know, you know, there's a there's an interesting divide between New York City and and, and Westchester and, and the outlying areas. You, as a contractor, cannot step foot in a building in, in New York City, and certainly in, in Manhattan, even if you're doing private work without all of this documentation. So in Westchester, it's much more difficult because many of the properties are sprawling and there's no way you know if a contractor, there's a, multiple ways in as opposed to one way in. So it's different and it's, it's more difficult. Good question. Would you say that the 
rules, regs, and what's required are, should be all unconsciously in an alteration agreement, which the cost of condo should have to be able to give to a shareholder, homeowner, or business owner as part of what they need to complete. Yeah, the repair renovation package for a unit owner or a shareholder should definitely encompass all of the risk transfer documentation requirements that we've discussed this evening. Yes, that would be a really good idea. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Many, many thanks to Jason, to Ken, to Peter, I'm sorry, to Peter Anderson. Great job, great program. Very often the CCAC board would welcome suggestions on meeting topics. If you have any suggestions on future topics of our association, feel free to contact me at the BRI. We'd be more than happy to have any suggestions that you may come up with. So thank you for your participation. We'll be in touch through email. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.